GCSE Chemistry Tutorial. Chemistryinfo.co.uk Topic 1 Key Concepts in Chemistry Starting with Atomic Structure But back in the 19th century, scientists thought that everything on Earth was made of just over 80 elements. These elements were famously arranged in a periodic table by Dmitry Mendeleev. At the time, it was thought that elements were made of indivisible spheres, called atoms. But each of the elements behaved in a different way. Did that mean that there were 80 different kinds of atom? And if so, what made them different? Were they different shapes or sizes? Or maybe the atoms were divisible. Maybe they were built of even smaller objects. The word atomus originates from the ancient Greek and means indivisible. At the start of the 19th century, Dalton said that all matter was made up of atoms, and these were like billiard balls. This idea has changed over time. By the end of the 19th century, J.J. Thompson had discovered cathode rays. These cathode rays were made of electrons originating from the atom. Thompson proposed a plum pudding model of electrons embedded in a positive cake. By the early 20th century, Rutherford's gold leaf experiment resulted in a model with very small, very dense, positively charged nucleus surrounded by electrons in shells. Later work by Chadwick, who discovered the neutron, and Niels Bohr, who talked about electrons in shells, resulted in the model we now know. Everything is made of atoms. But what are atoms made of? Scientists used to believe that atoms were solid particles, like tiny snooker balls. They thought atoms couldn't be split apart. This idea was changed in 1897 by J.J. Thompson. He was investigating the properties of cathode rays using this piece of equipment, an empty glass tube. Here's a modern version of Thompson's apparatus, an evacuated tube containing an anode and a cathode. Heat the cathode and it produces a beam of cathode rays. The beam cuts across a fluorescent screen. Scientists knew that a magnetic field could deflect the path of a cathode ray beam. Turn the magnet round and the beam is deflected in the other direction. Thomson measured the size of this deflection. He worked out that cathode rays were made of tiny particles, hundreds of times smaller than an atom. Thomson was also the first to deflect these beams with an electric field. The screen sits between two horizontal charged plates. An electric field between the plates deflects the path of the beam upwards. The positive plate attracts these cathode rays. The negative plate repels. Reverse the connections so that the polarity swaps over and the beam is deflected in the opposite direction. Again, attracted to the positive and repelled by the negative. From this, Thomson concluded that cathode rays must be made of negatively charged lightweight particles. He discovered what we now call electrons and went on to say that electrons were part of all atoms. In 1911, Ernest Rutherford made the next major breakthrough in atomic structure. He was examining the results of an experiment based on this type of setup. A radioactive source emits a narrow beam of radioactive particles. This is directed at a target of thin gold foil. Detectors register the presence of radioactivity at different positions. These displays will show the count rate in each detector. The experiment must be carried out in the dark in a vacuum. Start the detectors at the same time and the fixed detector behind the gold foil shows a high count rate. Most of the radioactive particles pass straight through the metal film. There's a much lower count rate on the other detector. 
This shows that a few radioactive particles have bounced back from the gold. But how could this have happened? Rutherford suggested that atoms contained a tiny, dense core called the nucleus, surrounded by lots of empty space. Imagine each snooker ball is the nucleus of one gold atom. And these marbles are the radioactive particles. Aim the marbles at the snooker balls. Most roll straight past to be detected behind our model gold atoms. It's this that made Rutherford think that there must be a lot of space within each gold atom. Our model also shows why some radioactive particles were deflected from the gold foil, having hit the dense central nucleus of a gold atom. Following Thomson and Rutherford, scientists have now discovered lots of particles inside the atom. You need to know about three. The proton, the neutron and the electron. A proton has a positive charge. A neutron has no charge. An electron has a negative charge. The nucleus of most atoms is made up of protons and neutrons. The only exception is the hydrogen nucleus. It contains just one proton. Each nucleus is tiny compared to the rest of the atom, which is almost all empty space. The only things there are electrons orbiting the nucleus at very high speed. In summary, the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. The proton has a charge of plus one, the neutron zero charge. Both have a mass of one. Electrons have a charge of minus one and a mass of approximately one two thousandth of an AMU. Most of the mass is concentrated in the nucleus, which is very small relative to the size of the atom. And a neutral atom contains the same number of electrons as it does protons. The periodic table is the most popular chemical pin-up in the world. In every science lab, you'll find the elements set out in exactly the same order. The layout isn't alphabetical, but it isn't random either. Every element in the periodic table is arranged in order of increasing atomic number. To understand atomic number, you need to look into the heart of an atom. Take hydrogen, the first element in the table. Orbiting around the outside of each hydrogen atom is one electron. and in the nucleus is one proton. Like all protons, it has a positive charge. Every hydrogen atom is the same. The atomic number is simply the number of protons in the nucleus. A hydrogen atom has one proton, so hydrogen's atomic number is one. Atomic number is usually written to the bottom left of the element symbol. So what about the next element in the table, helium? What's its atomic number? Helium has two electrons orbiting around the outside. In the nucleus, there are two protons and two neutrons. The atomic number is simply the number of protons. So the atomic number of helium is two. The next element along the periodic table is lithium. Orbiting round each lithium atom are three electrons. In the nucleus, there are three protons and four neutrons. So, what's the atomic number of lithium? The number of protons is three, which means that the atomic number is also three. As you move across a row from left to right, the number of protons increases by one, so the atomic number also increases by one. An element's atomic number determines its position in the table. Another number you need to understand is called the mass number. The mass number at the top position is usually a bigger number than the atomic number at the bottom. 
move along a row, the atomic number increases by a steady unit of one each time. But the mass number changes by irregular amounts. To understand mass number, once again, we need to look inside an atom's nucleus. Mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Hydrogen has just one proton in its nucleus and no neutrons. Its atomic number is one and its mass number is also one. So what about helium? It has two protons and two neutrons. Two plus two is four, so the mass number of this helium atom is four. Next, look inside a lithium nucleus. Can you work out its mass number? Three protons and four neutrons mean the mass number is seven. For every element, atomic number is unique. Again, in summary, using lithium as an example. The atomic number is defined as the number of protons in the nucleus. For lithium, that's three. The mass number is defined as the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. In this case, seven. We might use the mass number to describe the atom. For example, this would be lithium seven. By definition, all atoms of the same element contain the same number of protons. That's the same atomic number. Isotopes in the element have the same atomic number, but the number of neutrons, and hence the mass number, varies. Chlorine, for example, has two stable isotopes. The two stable isotopes of chlorine have mass numbers of 37 and 35. But the chlorine 35 is much more abundant at around 75.8% of all chlorine atoms. The relative mass or relative atomic mass takes this abundance into account to find an average. A mass of 35 with an abundance of 76% is added to a mass of 37 with an abundance of 24%, giving a relative atomic mass of 35.5. As a result, you will see mass numbers on the periodic table that are not whole numbers. And higher tier students may well be expected to calculate the relative atomic mass from mass numbers of isotopes and their abundance. Thank you for watching.